In this video I'm going to show you a full process of how to change a dated and inefficient heating system into a modern condensing over 90% efficient setup that actually is condensing, that actually is over 90% efficient and it's not just a sticker on the box that says it is. So what we have here is a uh, heat-only boiler on a sealed system already and a vented cylinder, typical S-plan, two zone valves, one for hot water, one for central heating and an external pump. And this is your typical vented cylinder which we will be changing into an unvented one and let me show you the loft. Cold water storage system that stores all the water that goes into hot water cylinder and it also supplies all the cold taps in bathrooms. So the only mains water is at the kitchen tap. Everything else comes from this cold water storage cistern. By removing that, we're gonna reconnect everything to the mains. And that's my new supply to the new cylinder. And obviously another thing that's gonna be different will have to run a temperature and pressure relief to the outside, which is luckily not that difficult because there's a cupboard in the room behind that wall and there's timber flooring and luckily joists, they go that way so we can just drop one pipe all the way to the outside and take it to the front and drop it to the floor we are in the middle of the works and the cylinder is already in place right now this is fully pressurized this is coming from the mains and let me show you how we've run uh main supply because it used to be just this pipe here 15 mil so that's not really adequate for the flow rates you want to achieve from an invented cylinder it has to be 22 so that's a new supply that new supply goes all the way there under the floor to the back of the house to the boxing where the drainage is and all the way down so that was quite a tricky uh, run. In here in this bathroom we took the floors up and I had to reconnect this towel rail because it was connected to the primaries going to the cylinder so it was working only with the hot water on which is kind of a traditional way of doing towel rails in bathrooms which allows for tower rails to be on uh, throughout the year in the summer as well. We're not doing it anymore because we're gonna run the system at two different flow or three different flow temperatures. One for underfloor heating, one for radiators, one for uh, hot water. And we don't want those radiators to become uh, super hot when the hot water is being recharged. So what we're doing here, we're also running additional supply for a towel rail in a shower room next door because it doesn't have any heating. That's my flow and return for central heating. And then we're gonna reconnect to those two 15 mil pipes right here. They will go to the shower room and that's my main supply going to the cylinder cupboard right there. That's the towel rail that will go on the wall and it will go on this wall and we've got floors up to run all the pipe work. And while Simon does this heating here, this radiator here, I'll go downstairs and I'll start on my overlay underfoot. So we've got all the pipe work installed today and manifold is installed and the system is fully pressurized. There's five bar pressure on the manifold right now and we're gonna leave it like that. So in some, if someone goes to the pipe work, they'll know immediately. Looks like it's time to change this boiler anyway because it burned through all the insulation in the combustion chamber and started burning through the outer case already. God knows how, how far away this boiler was from starting a fire. The installation is now commissioned and fully completed, pipe work insulated and let me talk you through the setup. What we have here is a 18 kilowatt uh, system boiler, Ecotec Plus 618. This property is a four bedroom, fully detached uh, house with a heat loss about 10 kilowatts. Which means we need 10 kilowatts of power when it's minus two outside to have 21 degrees inside. Why are we using the 18 kilowatts if the heat loss is only 10? Good point, we could have used 12, and I suggested 12 kilowatts, I said it would have been absolutely fine, but people are still a bit wary about installing correctly sized boilers to the heat loss. And I got asked to install a bigger one. There's uh, one slight benefit for uh, to installing a slightly bigger boiler, uh, reheat times on a cylinder that we installed, which is 250 uh, liters, will be 
a bit quicker. We've got obviously only flow and return under the boiler and it goes to a diverter valve right here. This may look like a standard zone valve, but it's not. It's not a mid-position valve, it only diverts to port A or port B. Port A is a normally closed port, port B is normally open port. So in a resting position it's open to B, which is my heating, and it's closed to A, which is my hot water cylinder. Now, if there is a call for heating, the valve is in its resting position, it's not energized, the boiler fires and circulates water with the boiler, there's a pump inside the boiler, through this device. This is what's called a low loss header. So the water goes to this device and goes back on a short, very short loop, back to the boiler. If there is a call for hot water, however, the water goes on a boiler pump all the way to the cylinder and back, and there is no circulation going through the low loss header. That valve cuts that circulation off. Why do we have a low loss header and what is a low loss header? Uh, low loss header is just a bit of a big pipe. You could actually put a bigger pipe here and do what's called closed couple T's or build your own header. The reason is, if you ever have more than one pump on the system, uh, you need to separate them uh, somehow. So we've got one pump on the boiler, then we've got two pumping stations right here, and they are behind the header. So the boiler pump circulates water between the boiler and the cylinder, bypassing the low loss header on hot water demand. And when there's central heating demand, the boiler goes only through the header. Then my two pumping stations right there, one for underfloor heating, one for radiators, are picking up water from the header and they distribute it to radiators or underfloor heating. Why are we doing it this way? The reason is if we didn't have this header here, and this was a straight run of pipe here and straight run of pipe here, so flow and return, those pumps would be pulling on the boiler pump and also probably pulling on, on each other as well. The, the theory is that we've got such a low velocity inside that header, it's just a bigger bit of pipe, and those pipes here also are sized for, for a lower velocity, that when those pumps kick in at the same time, they do not interact with each other. So that pump's not gonna pull more water out of the header or distribution pipe work to starve the other pump from uh, flow or to affect how that pump reads the difference in pressure. So we can use two pump independently on two different flow rates and two different temperatures in our case as well. So the idea is that this setup here, this pumping station here, does underfloor heating. And it does it at a higher flow rates or lower difference between flow and return. So on underfloor heating we're talking about difference between flow and return of around 7 degrees. On radiators, we would say 20 degrees normally, but because the system is designed to low temperatures, this is going at around 10 to 15 degrees difference between flow and return. They are a bit different, those pumping stations. If you look at this one, is what it's called a mixed pumping station. It has this electronic mixing valve, and that valve could be fully open to the flow, so flow goes to the system and return comes back, or it could be fully open just to the return. So this this station could circulate water just within the manifold and underfloor heating, not dipping into the flow from the boiler at all. And obviously between 0 and 10 there's all in between positions allowing mixing of hotter flow water with cooler return back from the manifold. And that allows us accurate temperature control on this station. On radiators we don't have a mixing valve because we don't need it, because radiators run at hotter temperatures so the boiler can adjust the flow that is sent to this station. We've got a number of sensors that are needed to correctly control this setup. So first of all, we've got an external wired sensor wired back to the boiler that relays the temperature outside back to the boiler, so-called weather compensation sensor. And that sensor, the principle is very simple. The colder it is outside, the hotter those two zones will fire. But again, independently at two different temperatures. In here, what we've got, on flows to all the zones, we've got those little NTC sensors. So that's one of them on a underfloor heating zone. That sends temperature back to this box here. On radiator circuit, we've got another of those sensors. Look right here. That reads the temperature of the flow going to 
uh, the radiators. So this sensor will tell the boiler exactly at what temperature to fire. This sensor will tell the boiler how to operate this blending valve to blend the temperature down. And there's yet another one of those NTC sensors going all the way to the cylinder. There's a pocket in the cylinder for the NTC sensor and all of those sensors are wired back to the Valent VR71 wiring center. Right here we've got connections from our sensors, so this is two zones. This is sensor from the cylinder right there. On the bottom we have relays, so those relays uh, control those two pumps. They also control diverter valve for hot water and we also have a control for this little uh, mixing valve that goes to this relay uh, number seven. Great bit of kit that allows amazing flexibility to Valent boilers. However, those wiring centers, you cannot buy them. The controls are also not available. Valent has serious manufacturing issues. It's not only Valent, other uh, manufacturers have similar issues. But in my opinion, if you cannot get the controls, if you are forced to use third-party controls, there's absolutely no point using Valent boilers. This, as a package, is an excellent setup, excellent system, and I absolutely love it. But if I can't get the controls and I have to connect something that does, does not communicate in eBus, does not allow we, me controlling uh, separate mixers, does not allow me weather compensation, does not allow me hot water priority, I don't see a point. I'd rather go back to Wisman or Intergas. So, Valent and Wisman, what they have in common is that they work best if they are used with their own controls. When it comes to Boilers that do support third-party controls, Intergas is the boiler of my choice because it works beautifully with third-party controls. Although this whole kit comes from Valent, those pumping stations are not from Valent. These are Flamco ones from uh, Mid Wales Plumbing Supplies from Richard Barrows. Large temperature gauges are also really, really nice. What those gauges do, they also act as isolating valves. Look. The zone is shut now if you have to service the pump or service the zone. And they also come with those nice insulated boxes. I guess we're done with those, so it's time to put them on. So why would you go to such an effort of putting additional pumping stations, to putting diverter valves, uh, expensive wiring centers, low-loss headers? Why would you want to do all of that if you could just put an S-plan? Three zone valves here. One for uh, hot water, one for underflow heating, one for radiators, and be done with it. Reason being, this setup is far superior to an S-Plan in terms of not only efficiency, but also comfort. Also, the system will last much longer if it's running at lower temperatures. S-Plan would fire at 70 or 75 degrees for all of those zones. The boiler would cycle a lot. The property would probably overshoot it in temperatures, wouldn't be really comfortable and it would be probably below 80% efficient. So why would you buy a really good boiler that can do so much as this one can here and just run it on an S-Plan? It's like, if you set it the way we did here, you can then have hot water priority firing at one rate for hot water. And then let's look at the boiler, what it does. It's running heating right now at 37 degrees. So the boiler is on heating, always condensing. The hottest it will ever fire on heating is 55 degrees. If you find it interesting and you want to move from an S-Plan to hot water priority, I'm going to post links to the schematics of this setup, both hydronics and controls, in the description of this video. I would say that if you want to learn how to do heat loss, how to size your boilers, how to choose your pumps, how to size your pipe work, how to size your radiators. If you want to know how to space under for heating pipe work, how to calculate output of that pipe work. Basically, if you want to design full heating systems and if you want to understand how they operate and how to make them as efficient as possible, Heat Geek Heating Mastery is the course you should be doing. I'm gonna post a link to that course below so you can sign yourself up and become an expert in system design and system installation. Okay, let me show you what the controllers are doing on this system. Inside the property, we've got two controllers. This one is a main controller, VRC720, and this can control 
the whole house, including the other zone that has its own thermostat. It looks exactly the same as this one, but only has functions for the radiators upstairs, while this one controls same radiators upstairs, underfloor heating here, and hot water. It's a really good controller, but there's still things that could be improved, and one of them is Legionella control, because traditionally we keep cylinders at 60 degrees C, which is just too hot for everyday use and quite wasteful on energy. So instead, I set my controllers, my setups to about 45 to 50 degrees in the cylinder, and then you run a Legionella cycle uh, once in a while. Now, what I don't like about this controller is that it doesn't allow you to choose how often the Legionella uh, function runs. So it will run it once a week, you can only choose a day. And another thing I don't like about it is the fact that you cannot choose the temperature it hits the cylinder up to. And some of my customers have reported that they had to disable this function because the water was getting just too hot. It was getting to 70, 75 degrees and there is a risk of scalding if you use a bath with that temperature. So. There could be another function added that will allow us to customize those controls, customize maximum temperature in the cylinder as well as how often that function is run, let's say once a month. This family here is seven people, so they don't have to run Legionella cycle weekly. They use enough water that they could probably run it once a month. I hope this video has been helpful for you. I hope now you get an idea of what an efficient system should look like. And if you enjoyed this video, you will love this one here, where I take you through a full Aerotherm Plus air source heat pump installation. Click on the link here now to watch it.